Good. It seems to me that the great omission of the Great Commission, as far as African Pentecostalism is concerned, is the lack of emphasis on teaching, research, and writing. It is the case that we sometimes preach with very little substance, and we are often un unaware of what is going on around us. Sometimes we rely on outsiders to come and tell us what is happening in our own backyard. Now, what is the point here? It will become clearer as we move along. This is because oftentimes we consider preaching and teaching as being essentially the same. When my brother introduced the session, he, talked, he made reference to a passage of scripture, watch your doctrine carefully. The question is, how then do you develop the doctrine in the first place? And what is it that you hold on to? Watch your doctrine carefully. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing, rightly dividing. What does that mean? We will look at all those. Sometimes we basically think that preaching and teaching are the same. As much as preaching may have teaching content, or some preaching may have teaching content, charisma or preaching in itself is more of proclamation, making a statement, rather than making a case for the statement. So in preaching, you make a statement. Jesus is Lord. You repent, and all the rest of it. But what is the meaning of Jesus is Lord? Because there's a background that informed that statement, Jesus is Lord. So Jesus is Lord, not just a statement, but there is something that fed or fits into that statement, Jesus is Lord. And it must be unpacked. Repent. Fine, great, repent, yes. But what does that mean? It needs to be explained and understood. Now, on the other hand, this way, don't get too worried about it. Didesco and its various forms means teach or teaching. And we find the word in Matthew 4, 23, Matthew 9, 35, 28, 20, Romans 12, 7, 1 Corinthians 4, 17, and 1 Timothy 2, 12, 1 Timothy 4, 11, among others. Here, teaching is not just to engage in a discourse, but also to research and dialogue on matters of scripture and society. In other words, for teaching to be meaningful, it must speak into situation. And therefore, the Christian teacher or theologian must have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. You must know and understand what is happening around you so that you speak into context. And the context also influences the discourse. Now, some of the challenges we've had in Africa is that for many, many years we have lived on borrowed theology. Big words that don't mean, they don't mean anything to us. And we have also inherited the quarrels of the Europeans and the Westerners. Arminianism and Calvinism and Arminianism and postmillennialism. Well, what does that got to do with the price of an egg to start with? It's great, but to start with, the people can't relate to it. They are more worried about witches and sorcerers. They are more worried about how do I put bread on the table the next day. They are not too worried about what Thomas Aquinas has said about something. And according to Plato and all the rest of it. I'm not saying that it is not good, but in that context, those are not the issues. So oftentimes, we buy into a theological foundation that we struggle to appropriate. Because they don't answer questions that the Africans are asking. I'm a little bit biased here in my presentation because here 
the focus was to inspire scholarship among African Pentecostal theologians and churchmen, if you like. So it is a little bit tilted in that direction. Of course, the one I did earlier was to engage the global space. So forgive me if I make a lot of reference to Africa. That is the reason why. Now, the Apostle Paul's admonition, steady to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, first, second Timothy 2.15, lends itself more to research and scholarship than just voicing a proclamation. There is one thing to read the Bible and another thing to study the Bible. You read for information, you study for understanding, and it comes with analysis. And I'll try to unpack this as we go along. The necessity of receiving an anointing is part of a Pentecostal theology and practice. But here is the catch. In the past, many Pentecostals took comfort in the words of the Apostle John. But the anointing which ye receive, or the anointing which ye have received of him, abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. Please take note of the King James Version. Because classical Pentecostals and some charismatic, they love that. For they think that is the one that has more anointing in the spirit. Even though sometimes they don't understand the words because they are archaic English. But they love it. We love isn't it? But the anointing which ye, ye means you, have received of him, I buy death. You see, that one, there is power in it. Death, I buy death. In you. And ye need not that any man teach you. Sometimes you be teacheth you. Teach you. <laughs> but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. Hallelujah. Then you know that thing is coming. First John 2, 27. King James Version. Very, very important. This verse was often taken to mean that formal education and scholarship were not necessary for the work of the ministry. But all that matters were what? The anointing upon one's life. You need not that any man teach you. It's the anointing that matters. So this anointing was understood to mean the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. With this particular orientation, Many Pentecostals refer to theological institutions and seminaries as cemeteries. A place where people went to kill their faith or were, pre or were prepared to what? Incarcerate the move of the Holy Spirit. So in the early years of the movement, Pentecostals were not too keen on formal education, theological education. It's a spirit that matters. Whatever that meant, we understood it that way. And so... If you went to Bible colleges and theological colleges, then it's basically you are, you are going to trouble the anointing. And please note, the King James Version of the Bible was also preferred as the most anointed, appropriate, and accurate translation of the Holy Scriptures. Yes. The most anointed, appropriate, and accurate translation of the Holy Spirit. The NIV is watered down. So you want the one that says teacheth, so you can feel it. <laughs> but then what they don't know is that the King James Version was authorized by the King James of England and Scotland in the 17th century. And in fact, we don't even have a copy of the original. And it was written to make sense to his subject. And the kind of language was what the English people were speaking at the time. Cometh and goeth. Today, they don't say that in England. If you did, they would take you to the hospital and examine. <laughs> the trend, however, has changed in recent years. But the fresh desire 
for education has now presented a new challenge. And as you can see in the pictures, isn't it? Indiana Christian University Apostle Council USA. Sometimes the sentence doesn't even make sense. Conferment of doctorate in ministry and installation of apostleship. For any information, contact 0544952433. So you have Bishop Dr. Richard. <laughs> Do you know something? That the, in the early years of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement, they were not interested in titles? Yeah. No, 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 no. Even titles like Doctor, B, no, Bishop, Reverend, they were not interested. Brother, so and so, sister, so and so. Then he went to evangelist, so and so. Then he came to pastor, so and so. And as the young guys started coming up, the others moved up. Commanding bishop, presiding bishop, this. Now we are running out of titles. <laughs> because within a short time, the young ones come up, and the big guys also have to go up. It's very interesting. The whole thing sounds like a drama. Yes. But it tells us a deeper problem, which I'll try and point out. This one is an in-house thing, so let's be honest and unpack this. And don't be too worried. Once I assume my role as a teacher or as a lecturer, the dynamics are different. If I meet you on Sunday, I'll be a bit softer. Some Pentecostals want to obtain their diplomas and degrees in as little time and with as little effort as possible. Thus, we have spirit-filled classical Pentecostals who don't see anything wrong in earning a master's degree in six months. And the PhD in six months after that. And some can do two PhDs at the same time. And you wonder what kind of school. With this development, it is obvious that the objective of the study is not to gain knowledge, but to obtain an academic title, even at the expense of academic integrity. While some travel this route, the Americans will say route, out of ignorance. Others are so thirsty for a doctorate that they will pay for an honorary degree from any institution that is prepared to offer one. As a matter of fact, all the institutions that I've shown on the board so far, they either don't exist or they had no accreditation whatsoever. And yet these are the ones conferring degrees on our ministers. This disturbing trend has caused governments in some nations working through national accreditation bodies to come up with policy guidelines in the award of degrees. Even now as we speak, Rwanda is considering legislation that would require all pastors to have genuine theological degree before they can open a church. So you see what is happening out of this problem. If you are not careful, even the liberty to, to proclaim the gospel and to establish a church becomes a challenge yeah. because of what is happening. Yeah. So we have to be careful that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot. It is my firm belief that the empowered 21 vision, that every person on earth would have an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit by Pentecost 20, 2033 is in accord with the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we read from Matthew 28, 19 to 20. And also embraces the rapid growth of the Pentecostal movement across the globe. The evidence here is quite startling. Just look on the map. At the moment, as of 2018, we are in 2018, we have a total of 2.5 billion Christians in the globe, or around the globe, which constitute about 33% of total population. 
And the distribution is what you can also see. North America, 277 million. Europe, 571 million. Asia, 388 million. Oceania, 29 million. Africa, 631 million. Latin America, 601 million. So for the first time this year, Africa has the most Christians. 30 million in excess of Latin America. Now, when the World Missionary Council was held in Edinburgh in 1910, it was estimated that the total number of Christians in Africa was 10 million. So between 1910 and 2018, it has shot to over 630 million. And the continent that was least evangelized at the time has now become a beacon of the gospel. What does that say to us? So early this year or late last year, Africa became the continent with the most Christians. But 50 years ago, only one person saw this coming. David Barrett boldly predicted that the number of Christians in Africa will reach 350 million by the year 2000. This was from a mere 10 million in 1910. Now, how did he know that? Scholarship, research, study, analysis, understanding what was going on, the phenomenon. 50 years ago, David Barrett pointed this out. In 2001, Barrett published the second edition of his seminal world encyclopedia, Christian encyclopedia, and he estimated the actual Christian population to be 360 million, which means that it was a little more than what he had even predicted, which was more than what he had originally predicted. And now we know it's about 631 million. Now, Barrett's classic reference book illuminated the changing demography of modern Christianity and the massive shift of the faith center of gravity from the west to the southern continents of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In that same period, around the dawn of the new millennium, Andrew Walls, a very distinguished missiologist and church historian from Aberdeen and for many years also studied, uh, taught at the University of Edinburgh, and Kwame Bediakon, the founding director of Akrofi Christella Institute of Theology, Mission, and Culture, were drawing our attention to the fact that not only was Africa practicing the faith, it was changing it as well. Christianity was becoming a non-Western religion. This assertion was reaffirmed when Philip Jenkins, in his weighty book, The Next Christendom, argued that Africa, alongside Asia and Latin America, would define the coming of a global Christianity by the year 2050. Jenkins observed that the stupendous growth of the church in Africa was principally in the Pentecostal charismatic strand of Christianity, and that these churches were far more traditional, morally conservative, evangelical, and apocalyptic than their northern counterparts. Beret and Harvey had previously drawn the same conclusions. And please take note why the growth was recorded principally within the tradition 
of the Pentecostal charismatics, where emphasis is placed on morally conservative, evangelical, apocalyptic, and of course, the work of the Holy Spirit. This development forces us to consider the statement by Andrew Walls that theology that matters will be theology coming from where the majority of Christians are. This by implication means that the theological reflections coming from the southern continent of Africa, Asia, and Latin America are now the most relevant to the world. This is where I make my point. If Pentecostals in Africa are to make a lasting contribution and impact on global Christianity, then they must rise up to rigorous research, reflection, and publishing of sound theology within the African context. This is not only a theological option, but also a missiological imperative. The late Professor Kofi Abrefi Abrefa Buzia, a sociologist and lay preacher of the Methodist Church of Ghana, and also a former Prime Minister of the Republic of Ghana, made an observation, and I quote him, for the conversion of the Christian faith to be more than superficial, the Christian church must come to grips with traditional beliefs and practices and with the worldview that these beliefs and practices imply. It will be unreal not to recognize the fact that many church members are influenced in their conduct by traditional beliefs and practices and by the traditional interpretation of the universe. The new convert is poised between two worlds, the old traditions and customs he is striving to leave behind, the new beliefs and practices to which he is still a stranger. The church would help him better if she understood the former while she spoke with authority about the latter. And so, S.J. Williamson, a Western missionary who was in Ghana and also an educator, came to the same conclusion when he wrote that there is a sense in which both Christianity and African culture face a crisis. These abiding concerns underpin the importance for African Pentecostal scholars and church leaders to rise to the occasion and address the pertinent issues that face the development of the church in Africa, and more especially, as it takes its mission to the rest of the world. Recent African Pentecostal scholars, such as Opoku Onyina, I'm sure some of you have seen him and heard him, have sought to address the issue of witchcraft, divination, and prophetism. But more needs to be done, particularly in the areas of faith, public life, and ministerial ethics. Obukalu, a Nigerian scholar who died sadly a few years ago, and Matthew Ojo and Kinsley Labi have provided us with good studies of historiography that have highlighted the nature and contribution of Pentecostalism in Africa. Many more scholars are emerging and they must be encouraged. I would like to propose a conceptual framework and methodology which could improve our efforts in academic research, teaching, and publishing as a means of advancing the cause of Pentecostalism in the global space. Pentecostal scholars must be able to articulate their beliefs and practices as they happen. This may call for a phenomenological approach. A phenomenological approach. There is the pressing need to document and analyze all the available resources 
Prospective research students must be encouraged to study, organize, catalog, and arrange church files such as council meeting minutes, memoirs, diaries, and sermon notes of leaders. This work would facilitate access to these important primary sources of information for present and future research. Church artifacts and historical monuments must be preserved. Sadly, you visit some Pentecostal churches and important church buildings and artifacts that were available, they put all of them down and then put concrete on them, on them big churches. What they fail to realize that these traditional artifacts, if you like antiques, have historical value. I will never forget the day I was taken on a sketching to see Shakespeare's house in Britain, Stratford upon Avon, and also Shakespeare's wife's house. And we're queuing to go and see the house. Why? They, they, they have made it valuable. And tourists will travel all around the world, all over the world, to just come and what? And see. Because Shakespeare carries some value. And his house valuable and the whole industry had developed around it because when you go there the sun is hot in summer you buy an ice cream parking about two pounds you know brochure five pounds are you with me that is how nations develop it starts from the mind but then things that are valuable to us we throw them away let's think about them again if you have a key leader who began a church that has a history to it, you preserve things that posterity can come and look at and ex examine and study. You don't throw them away. Africa must learn that, at least from the Europeans. You see, we need to appreciate home. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We are always looking elsewhere. But we must develop the heritage that God has given to us. It has theological significance as well as economic good. And I'll come back to this at some point. Imagine African scholars must contribute to the existing literature and wider scholarship on the Pentecostal movement. Most of the academic materials on African Pentecostalism has been written by outsiders. The ethic approach. This is helpful, but we need the insider perspectives as well. The emic approach. This constitutes an empirical approach to research. African Pentecostal scholars need to have both a devotional and relevant orientation to research and writing. So we are not just writing for the sake of writing. We must write as inspired by the Spirit. In other words, their writings must never forget the layperson as well. Ivory Tower discourse must be avoided at all costs, where theological formulations and discourse don't make sense to the average person. Writing that are too bookish do not help anybody, except those involved in helping themselves. The academic community must be an integral community and not an elite community. Scholarship as ministry means that the theologian or scholar is first a servant, and the product of his or her work must be a tool that serves the purpose of God's mission. By this, I mean that the work of the scholar must be prophetic and it must impact global generations for a common good. In the history of the church, scholars emerged from within specific traditions and sought to interpret and explain their experiences and mission. Their writings then became the primary sources upon which 
other research was based. In the case of African Pentecostalism, however, much of what we know about our movement is what outsiders, outside sociologists, church historians, and theologians in other denominations, traditions, and cultures have written about us. This is not only an anomaly, but could also lead to a confused identity. We are the best people to describe what is happening in our own house. There is the urgent need that is looking at the way forward. There is the urgent need to commit time and resources into research. teaching and publishing. In most cases, if not all cases, African Pentecostal scholars have to look for outside funding to research and publish their own findings, except for those who teach in academic institutions which may offer some minimal annual grant towards research. African Pentecostal churches and associations must consider pooling resources together to fund relevant research and publications. The Church of Pentecost, for example, has established an archival and literary unit that seeks to coordinate and promote research and publishing. This must be encouraged. A division of the Pentecost Press in Ghana should perhaps be established and considered a publication unit of the Pentecost University College or the Pentecost Theological Seminary. This division could be named Pentecost University Press or Pentecost Academic Press and be tasked with becoming the publication unit for African Pentecostal scholarship. This may be similar to that of Paternoster of the Catholic Church, the IVP for the Evangelical Movement in Europe, Oxford University Press or the Cambridge University Press. In this case, that division of Pentecost Press would become a publishing house supported by all the relevant expertise for publishing by international standards. What we normally have with some of these church presses is that they are basically a printing press. What goes in is the same thing that comes out. They are not publishing houses. So they cannot produce material that can meet international standards. And that's the point I'm trying to make. We need to equip them. They must have qualified proofreaders, you know, people who do things that publishers are supposed to be doing so that we can raise the standard of our scholarship and be able to put something in the public domain that could be respected. Once this division is in place, operational systems for circulation of publications across the world can be formulated. Meanwhile, the original division of Pentecost Press could still continue its work for the church and the local market. The reason why I'm citing the Pentecost uh, Press as, as an example is that I'm familiar with the resources there. It's great. But what I'm saying is that instead of this press serving just one church, you know, we can see how a division could be created and then we step up the production to be able to serve the global market, if you like, and also to champion the cause of Pentecostal scholarship. You need, we need a press or a publishing house to do this. The need to establish a strong network, that is establishing a strong network within. The need to establish a strong network which can find expression in associations such as the African Pentecostal Fellowship, APF, or the Association of Pentecostal Theologians of Africa. The association would meet at least once in every two years. And this is where I'm making a case for a think tank. You know, people who will step back, do the research, analyze, get us some results, put it in the domain for the church to use. Most of the church surveys that we have are done by scholars. And that work helps us to know the least evangelized areas where there are specific needs and how we can strategize for mission. And so we need the scholars to support the work um, of the ministry. In fact, 
scholarship is also part of the ministry. And uh, the next point is to be able to recruit from within. Identify and develop emerging Pentecostal scholars who would recognize the importance of ministry, the, the important ministry of teaching, research, and, and publishing. The importance of ministry, the ministry of teaching, research, and publishing. I know for sure that because in many African societies, you see, all the attention is on the pastor, the apostle, the bishop, the minister. People who have the teaching gift don't seem to have space. Although we talk about fivefold ministry, but a lot had collapsed into the other, and we're always ending up with prophets and apostles and bishops and commanding bishops. Now, what happens then is that this system had even been misunderstood and misinterpreted. It suggests more of a hierarchy and like something like a public service kind of, a, um, what do you call it, um, bureaucracy. What it means here is this, sadly, that people who are gifted as teachers who should come and stay in that all want to become bishops or apostles. They don't want to stay in the academy. Why? Because they think that once they go there, they are ignored. Nobody appreciates their work. But until we change that attitude and perception, we would undermine ourselves. I think that every ministry area must be respected for what it is and understand that there are avenues for service and we must equip them for them to function effectively. A friend came to my office once who was teaching in a seminar and said to me that, well, Emmanuel, you see, I want to leave the academy next year. So why do you want to leave? And this is why we spent a lot of time discussing courses that we want to introduce that would help, and he has offered to come and teach for me as an agent. He was in one of the big seminaries. Then he said, well, nobody knows that we are even here. My colleagues who went out and became presidents of churches, and no, they are all doing well. Here, the students leave and they even forget about you. So you also want to go to the field. They call it the field, in other words, the church, because that is where they take the offering. They don't take offering in classrooms. So here is my conclusion. Theological reflection, research, and writing are part of our pilgrimage in mission. They are not an option or an appendage. Relevant theology arises from the church's mission. It is the servant and not the master. People must not only hear the gospel, but they must also understand it and be able to teach it. As we seek to spread the good news of the kingdom to cover the world as the waters cover the sea, we must stand together with the members of the church of Christ and equip them with the tools and understanding that they need to make their mission more efficient and effective to the glory of God. This involves serious theological and cultural research, reflection, and writing so that we can properly understand and impact Africa and beyond. If we know our world, we can reach it. And this, in my view, may be a sure way of contributing to the achievement of the empowered 21 vision by 2033. Thank you very much.